what would be a logical next step? The uh, methanol to attack. This is a nucleophile. Neutral oxygens are not great nucleophiles, but it's easy for them to attack carbocations. So now we can attack this carbocation. Here we have a nucleophile. So we're not just going to wait for the water to come back on. Now the alcohol can come in. Well, when it comes in, one thing to notice is that it could uh, come in from either above or below. It would look like this. And then what would be a logical step? The H would pull out. Yeah, then it would depregnate. We could use the conjugate base of whatever acid we were using, or we could use another alcohol molecule to take it off. So that would give us this. trigonal planar carbocation is going to come in from either both from both above and from below. So we'll get two diastereomers of each other. What type of functional group did we say we started with here? Right. And what type of functional group do we have here now? A full acetone. Now it's full because now there's two OR groups. The OR group in the ring and this new OR group that came in. Of course, we would expect that because now we've had two alcohol attacks. The first alcohol attack was when we formed the ring in the first place, and now we've had a second alcohol attack. So now we really have been a category three type reaction. First from the alcohol that was intramolecular and then from the intermolecular alcohol attack. Now, a sugar acetal is called a glycoside. So, this is a glycoside. That's a sugar acetal. Sugar acetals or sugar ketals are glycosides. Specifically, this would be called a glucoside because it's from glucose. Now, do you remember, why did we make acetals and ketals back in the aldehyde and ketone chapter? Well, one big point was that they were protecting groups. Remember that um, acetals and ketals are protected from, a uh, well, they're not protected from acid, but they're protected from base and from nucleophiles. So this is now protected from bases and from nucleophiles. So if we want to use a base or a nucleophile, and they're also protected usually from um, oxidizing agents and reducing agents. So now if we want to use oxidizing agents or reducing agents or base or nucleophile anywhere else on these other functional groups, now this carbon is protected. Of course, that doesn't do us any good unless we can get back to what we started. Do you remember how did we usually reverse that protection? Uh, adding some sort of reducing agent? Remember, this is protected from reducing agents. Oh, H plus and H2O? Yeah, H3O plus. Remember, we're not doing the type of deprotection that we did for amino acids and peptides. Um, when we were revealing carbonyls, we just kind of used H3O+. You can see how that would work. What would H3O+, do? It would protonate this to make it into a better leaving group, and then when this leaves, the water would come in and replace the OH group. This is the former carbonyl oxygen, right? Well, the second alcohol has kicked off that carbonyl oxygen. If we want to put it back on, this is not the carbonyl oxygen anymore. So if we want to put it back on, we use acid to make this into a better leaving group. Um, and then the water would come back in and replace this. That would just be the same exact reaction we kind of just did here, except instead of the hydroxy leaving and being replaced by the alcohol, the alcohol could leave and be replaced by the hydroxy. So that would be what you would do after you finished with uh, the reactions that you wanted. So one good way to protect the anomeric carbon is by making it into a glycoside. Uh, and this is just an application of the aldehyde and ketone chemistry that we saw before. And again, how did we know that it was only going to happen here? Well, the whole purpose of the acid was to give us a better leaving group. But this is a much better leaving group than any of the other oxygens because when it leaves, the carbocation is stabilized by resonance. If we added a huge excess amount, would it do all of them as well? Uh, possibly. They, they would give you secondaries, but that's not something I've seen discussed anywhere in the, uh, in the, uh, in the course or in the textbook, so I don't think that's going to come up. In the typical reaction, um, uh, these reagents are just going to um, attack the anomeric carbon. Okay, so that's one important uh, protection strategy there. So uh, to get rid of them, you just add H plus H2O. That's right. Yeah, H3O plus. 
And again, the mechanism for how that works should be very apparent. The acid makes this into a better leaving group, and then after it leaves, the water brings in a new hydroxy group. It's just the same type of reaction that we, as we just had here. And of course, whenever we do this, we end up with a mixture of products, because we're going through a trichomoplanar carbocation intermediate. All right, so that's how we make um, glycosides. Wait, so we're Because they did five equivalents of the hydrogen and five of them, like the excess of this. Right. So that's a totally different reaction. Notice that's under basic conditions. Notice that, so in this case, notice um, in those cases, the oxygens are not being leaving groups, they're being nucleophiles. Um, so that's just a completely different type of reaction. We can use these. Remember that alcohol oxygens could either be potential nucleophiles or leaving groups. Um, so I started with the case where we make an oxygen into a leaving group. Well, if you're going to make an oxygen into a, into a leaving group, this is the oxygen that's most likely to be the leaving group because when it leaves, you're stabilized by resonance. But we also have to look at the cases where the oxygens are nucleophiles. That can happen too. So you would want to protect it if, for example, like you end up with methyls on all three of the other oxygens, but you still have that hydroxide in that end. Right. If they ask you to synthesize that from mm -hmm. that, then you first protect it and then add methyls and then deprotect it. Again. Sounds good. Yeah, that's a good plan. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I should say is we've seen that acetals and ketals are protecting groups because they're protected from base and from nucleophile and from oxidizing agents and reducing agents. Obviously, they're not protected from acid, right? Because that's how we remove the protecting group. The one thing that this is not protected from is acid because we use acid to deprotect it. Also, you can see that hemiacetals and hemiketals are not protected. If they were, we couldn't form the acetal in the first place. That's the whole reason we needed this protection. So hemiacetals and hemiketals are not protecting groups. Only the full acetal and the full ketal is a protecting group. Obviously, this is reactive because that's how we made it into the acetal in the first place. Remember what would happen here. It would form the bird's eye, which we don't like calling it because it's not something that it's just a protected element. Yeah, so what type of product would we get? Uh, acetone. That's right, that's really the same type of reaction we've just been talking about. This would be the attack of an alcohol on a aldehyde or a ketone. This would be what we call category three, right? So uh, we skipped the mechanism here, but. Um, Eventually, in a category three reaction, the carbonyl oxygen gets completely kicked off. And it's replaced by these used alcohols. And since the alcohols happen to come from the same molecule, we're going to get a cycle. Now, here's another way we could have written this. Can you see that this is the same exact reaction? It just is a little hard for students to see it, because in the past, we usually thought of the alcohol as attacking the aldehyde or the ketone. And here, you're kind of thinking of the ketone as attacking the alcohol, but it's the same deal either way. So what can happen between this molecule and these reagents? The OHs would attack. Um... That's right. Now, at first, students rarely see this because previously they never thought of ketones as attacking alcohols. They only thought of the alcohols as attacking the ketones. But now we're focusing on the sugar. So we're, start, we're kind of starting with the alcohol and adding the ketone. Whereas in the past, we were focusing on the ketones and adding the alcohols. Now, 
we need two alcohols to attack this. But there's a whole bunch of alcohols here. So which one should attack? The arrow. The and the the one next to it would form a one thing. And then those two would form another. That's right. Why? Because they're it's pointing in the same direction. You got it. All right. Very good. Obviously, it would be very hard for this oxygen and this oxygen to attack the same ketone because they're pointing in opposite directions. Same as this because this, the one you showed before has free rotation about that bond, but since this is a ring, there's no free rotation. Right. Yeah. So there's no free rotation. Things are stuck in their up or down positions. So you generally cannot have two alcohols that are pointing in opposite directions attack the same ketone, or at least that's not preferred. Um, so you're absolutely right. We could have one ketone attack here, so I guess I'd want to put in two equivalents. So let's draw what the ultimate product would be from that. What would be the product that we would get if um, we did this reaction? 